This is Duke University. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Schoenfeld. I'm the Vice President for Public Affairs and Government Relations at Duke, uh, and I'll be the MC today. There are few more exciting events in the life of a university than the announcement that one of our colleagues has received the Nobel Prize. And today is one of those days, and we are pleased to be here to recognize and to introduce the 2012 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, Dr. Robert Lefkowitz. The <clears throat> the James B. Duke Professor of Medicine and Biochemistry and investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institutes. Dr. Lefkowitz shares the prize with Brian Labilka, a former student of his who was an assistant professor of medicine at Duke before joining the faculty at Stanford, which itself has uh, just completed a press conference, uh, which you can see uh, later on if you want to at www.stanford.edu. Uh, today we will have brief remarks from Nancy Andrews, the Dean of the Duke School of Medicine, followed by President Richard Broadhead, and then Dr. Lefkowitz. Uh, Victor Zhao, who is the Chancellor for Health Affairs at Duke, is in China now and sends his congratulations. If you would like to get, uh, get in contact with him for a further conversation or a statement, uh, please see Doug Stokey. Um, we will have time for questions after this. This, this uh, program is being webcast live around the world in living color. And we will also be taking questions from um, uh, people who are watching, from reporters who are watching the webcast. Uh, uh, when, we, when it is time for questions, I do ask that you identify yourself before asking your question. And um, then we're off to the races. Uh, Dean Andrews. Well, I think this has to be the most fun thing I have done since I became dean of this medical school. Uh, it's a tremendous day for the School of Medicine and for all of, the, of Duke University celebrating the achievements of our colleague, Dr. Robert Lefkowitz. I think there are three ways that a medical scientist can be great. By making discoveries that immediately transform patient care, by making scientific contributions that stand the test of time, and by mentoring the next generation of scientists. Bob Lefkowitz has accomplished all three, and I think it's fair to say he has done it over and over and over again. His four-decade career, all here at Duke University, is a perfect example of how the most fundamental, curiosity-driven research changes the world. He has over 750 published scientific papers, He's won nearly all of the major awards in biomedical science, uh, and that includes the National Medal of Science presented by President Bush. I think it takes great imagination and determination to start with a hunch and a bunch of test tubes, and with years of hard work, pave the way for the development of the largest class of drugs we have to fight disease. Bob Lefkowitz started with the idea that there must be a molecule on the outside of cells that tell cells when they come in contact with adrenaline. Not everyone believed that at the time, but he went on to find that molecule and to understand it in great detail. He also discovered that there are many other similar molecules that help cells react to other kinds of signals. We now know that there are over 1,000 of these related molecules called G-protein coupled receptors. I think that's pretty amazing when you consider that there are only about 20,000 to 25,000 genes in people in total. These receptors do many different things, and I think that we're still only scratching the surface of understanding their importance. Between one-third and one-half of all prescription drugs target these receptors, and these drugs are used to treat many different conditions, including high blood pressure, heart disease, ulcers, and, and so on. Dr. Lefkowitz is still a very active scientist and teacher. He is an enormously prolific mentor with more than 200 former students and postdoctoral fellows. Uh, I think that there is no question that his scientific influence will last for decades. We have had for some time now at Duke a Coach K, and I'd like to propose that going forward, 
We recognize Bob's tremendous mentorship by calling him Coach L. He's also, uh, as you'll hear more, uh, a tremendous citizen of Duke, and we could not be more proud. Congratulations, Bob. I'm Richard Broadhead. I'm the president of Duke. Uh, what a joy for all of us. This uh, treasure we knew we had in our midst, now to have it lifted up. You've gotten every honor. I went to the National uh, Medal of Science Award uh, before. But I just remember, when I came to Duke as president, uh, Sandy Williams was then dean of the medical school. And he said to me, apropos of nothing, he said, uh, the first person currently at Duke most likely to win a Nobel Prize is Bob Lefkowitz. Uh, uh, and, and I said, well, why would that be? Uh, and he said, well, because he made this discovery that is fundamental to the way almost all or, or huge categories of drug therapies work that we all take for granted as uh, the, front, the frontier of medicine. And he explained it to me in considerable detail. Uh, when I met Dr. Lefkowitz, I then uh, called your lab, do you remember? I came over one afternoon, and, and uh, it was just uh, so fun to meet a person who is in every way so modest, so uh, pleasant, so uh, 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 amazed at what he has done with his own mind and curiosity. But the thing that I think everybody knows who's ever come in contact with Bob Lefkowitz is he's just one of the world's natural teachers. And I mean by that, he's one of the world's natural sharers. Uh, the fact that the Nobel Prize, the, the other prize given today, is given to one of your collaborators uh, who you helped train is just perfect, because in a way it recognizes that you made two contributions. One was your discovery, and the second was your discovery of the powers of mentoring, the powers of developing the talents of others. Uh, what, what could make a university prouder? We speak at Duke of knowledge in service of society, and you know your work has had enormous benefit to society at the level of human well-being, but it didn't have that well, that, that effect just because you were nice or went over and patted people on the head. You had to do the scientific labor of discovering the fundamental uh, uh, unknown, invisible physical properties that would make that kind of therapy possible. So that was the knowledge that then was able to be put in service to society. My hat is off to you. You are a great citizen of Duke and of uh, the, the scientific world. And congratulations on this wonderful honor. Bob Lefkowitz. I have prepared no remarks, uh, as many in my lab would say that won't hinder me from speaking for a while. Uh, needless to say, uh, I'm thrilled, I'm excited, uh, I'm delighted to be sharing the award with a former student of mine whom I admire and who I'm very fond of, and so that, that makes this a very nice occasion. And I'll say in all honesty that I'm thrilled uh, for the institution because the recognition, of course, while it's of me and Kobilka, it's a recognition of the institution. Uh, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is our first Nobel. I know it won't be our last. Uh, but I think th that, that will help to burnish the luster that we so well deserved. And uh, th that's very special for me as well. Uh, I really cherish, cherish your comments, Dick, about uh, the things I've done in my career. The, the, the mentoring is extraordinarily important to me. And you use the word sharing, but anybody who knows me is that it's all about the sharing. I mean, in a certain almost mystical sense, I've always felt that whatever scientific discoveries we made, that was almost the byproduct. What it was really about day to day was just sharing the experience of doing the work. Uh, and somehow the discoveries just sort of flowed from that. So. I think that's been uh, a great joy to me, as has, and I think Kobilk is a good example. Uh, he joined me when he was, he had no research experience whatsoever. He was a cardiology fellow, much as I had been at one point in my career. And I realized early on he was something very special. But most of my trainees are something special, but each one in a different way. And so I view my job as finding out what's special about them and helping them to realize it, and helping them to leverage whatever God-given gifts they have to do something special. And I think I helped Kobilka a little bit along the way with that. So uh, yeah, it's an exciting time for myself, for my family, for my lab family. 
uh, and hopefully for the institution. We, we had a little celebration earlier today uh, down at the end of the hall in the building where I work, and colleagues were flocking in, and you could just see there was a real joy, a shared joy. Uh, so in a very real sense, this is our accomplishment. I've been fortunate to spend my entire career here. Came in 1973 right out of my training uh, at Havid uh, at the Mass General Hospital. And uh, Duke was not the powerhouse in 1973 that we are today. And it never occurred to me I'd be here for my entire career. But you know, it worked. And it was working very well. And I just at every stage, I couldn't imagine uh, leaving. Uh, and so here I am, uh, just about 40 years later, uh, still at it. Uh, if you were a fly on the wall in 1973 and now, my daily activities wouldn't look very different. I'm still just hard at it. The lab is bigger, but I'm pretty much doing what I've been doing, which is doing science and interacting with my fellows and just having a hell of a good time. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions anybody wants to ask me about any of it. I understand that uh, my name's Jeremy Colessio from the Associated Press. I understand that you had a conversation by Skype with Dr. Kobilka today, and I'm wondering what you had to say to him, and also what did you have to say to New Yorkers on television? Well, Kobilka and I talked only very briefly. He has this thing about Skype. Uh, you know, there's a generational thing. People of my generation don't Skype all that much, but he's always Skyping me. Uh, so we did Skype. Uh, there wasn't a lot exchanged, uh, but what little was actually very moving. Uh, I had the feeling that this prize to me wouldn't have been possible uh, without the work that Kobilka did the last 10 years in which he sort of took the story that I had developed and that he had been working and took it to yet another level by doing what are called crystal structures of the receptors. And I had the feeling that uh, maybe that was what pushed this over the line so that when you put the totality together, they felt, wow, this is now a very complete rounded story. And so I said, you know, Brian, there's no way this would have happened to me if it wasn't for your work. And uh, he, he basically, responded that obviously the, the opposite was true as well. New Yorkers, I told them they were interested in me, be, talking to me. This was a show called uh, Good Morning New York. Apparently it's a TV show. And uh, they, they said they wanted to talk because they read that I was a New Yorker and from the Bronx. Uh, and I told them that I, I truly was, even after 40 years living in Durham, a New Yorker at heart, that I could recite for them the batting order of the New York Yankees in the early 50s, including the uniform numbers of every player, including Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Muscara, and the whole bit. Uh, and I talked about how I used to go to Yankee Stadium. They asked me where I went to high school. I said, where do you think? They said, Bronx Science? I said, yes. Uh, this was a, a school for academically talented students that has apparently, I was told by a subsequent email from somebody, uh, now has eight Nobel laureates to their credit. Seven in physics and me. Uh, so, uh, and you know, a point I didn't mention before, but which is, uh, you know, is really a surprise. I, I never anticipated if, of course, Everybody in science, I guess, dreams in some private reverie, oh, maybe someday I'll get a Nobel Prize. I certainly never dreamed I would get it in chemistry. Uh, I would have thought medicine. But the work is really very much at the boundary. I mean, it's of interest that both Kobilka and I are physician scientists. Neither one of us has a PhD. Uh, a lot of what we do is sort of self-taught. Uh, but we use the techniques of primarily biochemistry to try to solve biological problems, which turn out to have a lot of medical and pharmaceutical relevance. I also asked them, by the way, in New York, whether they thought I had a New York accent. And there, were, there was a, two hosts, a man and a woman. They seemed to disagree on that. Uh, so then I asked if they thought I had a southern accent, and they disagreed on that. So uh, that was about it. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, you, you read about this stuff in the paper, 
sometimes, and it's exactly like you read about. So at 5 a.m., the phone rings. I hear nothing. I sleep with earplugs, uh, which seems to have caught the attention of the press uh, to a greater extent than some of the scientific things I've had to say. But anyway, <laughs> be that as it may, uh, I do sleep with earplugs. It does seem to help me sleep better. So I, my wife has to wake me up every morning because I don't hear the alarm clock. And need to say I didn't hear this call. Uh, but right at 5 a.m., I get an elbow, and uh, she says it's Stockholm calling. Well, I mean, so, I mean, the first thing that goes through my mind is obviously they're not calling to find out the weather here in Durham. I mean, th 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 this must be something important. But they get right to it. Uh, the uh, a woman who was apparently the secretary of the Nobel Committee uh, says, Dr. Lefkowitz, we're calling with some very good news. You are the recipient of this year's Nobel Prize in chemistry. Uh, let me turn you over to Dr. Normark, who is the chair of the committee. And then I spoke with him for a few moments. And then he passed the phone around. But at that point, I was too uh, distracted to know how many members of the committee I spoke to. It was more than one, less than five. That's about all I know. Uh, interestingly, it was only when I got to the third one that I realized I had no idea whether I was sharing the prize with anybody. It was at that point that I asked, am I sharing this prize? And they said, yes, with Dr. Kobilk. And I, that was just the best. Perfect. Uh, and. Uh, then they asked me to stay on, well, they said they would like me to come back on the phone in half an hour to be present by phone for the announcement and then to take a few questions. And uh, so we did that. And then in the uh, intervening uh, half hour, I just drank a lot of coffee uh, <laughs> and just kept pacing around, you know, trying to sort of get my head around it. And that was about it. And then since then, it's been pretty much nonstop but very exciting. Yeah. Could you ask me that again in a slightly louder voice? Okay. So what brought me to Duke? Uh, in 1972, uh, I was a fellow uh, in cardiology at the Massachusetts General Hospital, working in the lab of a mentor, uh, Edgar Haber. Uh, and I had been offered an assistant professorship to stay at Harvard the following year. Uh, but I had been making presentations of some of my work at the American Heart Association and some other organizations like the American Society of Clinical Investigation. And it apparently had caught the attention of two physician scientists at Duke a man named Andy Wallace, who was then chair of the, uh, who was chief of the cardiology division, and later would be well, head of the hospital, Ralph? Andy yeah, was the CEO of the hospital. Uh, and uh, so he was interested in the work, and uh, so was Jim Weingarten, who was the chairman of medicine. And so they had me down, and uh, it seemed like a, a good offer, but, uh, you know, I ran to, why would you go to Duke if you can stay at Harvard? And so they made me an offer. I still remember the starting salary was 24000 And uh, not that that was a factor, but I just remember that number. So I said that uh, I turned the offer down. And, uh, but they wouldn't take no for an answer. They wrote back and they said, what would it take? So I... I I talked it over with my wife, and I put together a list of what I felt were demands that were far beyond what was reasonable for somebody at my stage of a career, uh, figuring that would be the end of it. But uh, I heard nothing for a month, and then they called back and said, well, we'll give you everything that you're asking for. When I look back on it, it wasn't that crazy. One thing that did not come up is I didn't say anything about the salary, because I didn't care about the salary. But they raised it from 24 to 32, uh, which was a huge increase, and I wasn't asking for that. But the, uh, the interesting thing was how shrewd Jim Weingarten was, because he didn't give me a raise for four years. And he subsequently told me that that was why he was able to give me such a big salary, because he knew damn well I wasn't getting any raises for the next four years. Uh, so that's how I came to Duke. Uh, as to why I was interested in this particular problem, my first research experience was at the NIH in 1968 through 1970. This was the peak of the Vietnam War. 
and there was a draft, and there was a doctor draft. If you were academically inclined and had been successful in your academic career, you could compete for positions in what was called the United States uh, Public Health Service. And if you got a commissioned position there, you could then go to the NIH to do research. That turned out to be a training ground for multiple Nobel laureates. In my class, between 68 and 70, there were either four or five Nobel laureates already before this, uh, and that's out of a class of eight people. Uh, in fact, I, for years I've been telling people that I was sort of the schlepper in the group, I'm like the only guy who never won a Nobel Prize, but I did okay anyway. Uh, so uh, while at the NIH, I became interested in receptors. Uh, it was a nascent field, nothing was known. I worked and I got some, uh, some uh, kudos for what I had done, and it kind of whetted whetted my appetite. And uh, so when I left the NIH, I became interested in pursuing receptors again. And, but I wanted to work on a different kind of receptor. I worked on kind of a hormone receptor there. And I was a cardiology fellow. And it was two things drove the ultimate decision to work on adrenaline receptors. One, uh, that that seemed much more relevant to cardiovascular disease. And two, chemically, there were many different molecules, adrenaline derivatives, or antagonists of adrenaline receptors, known, which I felt I could leverage chemically uh, to, uh, to profitably study the receptors. So it was a combination of it's cardiovascularly relevant, and there are tools available that I can leverage. And I think those were the two things. By the way, in my opening remarks, I did not uh, call out, if you will, a number of the sources of support that have made my research possible. Uh, and I don't just mean financial, although I mean that too, uh, but in many different ways. Uh, I've been an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute since 1976. Uh, that is, by the way, the longest tenure that anybody's ever had at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, and that funding uh, has been enormously helpful, as has the contact with remarkable colleagues through the meetings, et cetera, that we go to once or twice a year. In addition, and they've paid my salary, by the way, and have been the major source of my support since 1976. Uh, and it's a very competitive system to sort of stay active. It's a non-tenure system. You never get tenure. You have to basically... Uh, be renewed every five years after a very competitive uh, process. And then there's Duke. Uh, I've served under a number of chairs of medicine uh, and under three CEOs. Bill Anlian uh, was the, the, uh, the dean when I came, and he was subsequently succeeded by uh, Ralph Snyderman, my closest friend, uh, and now Victor Zhao. Uh, and all of them have been remarkably uh, supportive of my work, as has the dean's office. Uh, I'm thinking of Sandy Williams and now Nancy Andrews, who have always been very supportive of me. Uh, and that kind of support means a great deal, uh, both in very real terms in having the, the capital to do what you need to do, but also in terms of having the support. I'm so sorry Bill isn't here right now, uh, because I would say for at least 25 years, maybe more, uh, he's been telling me, and he told me this as recently as about eight weeks ago when he and I had lunch together with Ralph in Ralph's office. For 25 years or more, he's been telling me, you know you're going to win the Nobel Prize. He always would let me know that he's somehow uh, working for me, uh, although how that would be, uh, I don't think either of us knows. And he always told me, and he told me again, Ralph, in your office, he expects his 10 percent cut. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if he's serious. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, I've, I've had a great deal of support. Uh, yes? Hi, Diana Bosch. Please speak up.
Okay. So if I understand the sense of your question, it's sort of how, explain a little bit about the research and how it may have influenced and influence in the future clinical medicine. Is that the idea? So I think probably most of you may have seen some of the material that's out there already on the web about what receptors are. There are these molecules embedded in the cell membrane that hormones and drugs, uh, neurotransmitters uh, have to bind to uh, to activate processes inside the cell. It's very much, we often use the analogy simple, but very reasonable of a lock and a key. So the keys are molecules that are circulating in the blood, adrenaline, histamine, serotonin, dopamine, glucagon, could go on and on and on. But they all have different shapes and sizes, and they're on the outside of the cell, and they can't get in. So how do they influence what the cell's doing? They bind to one of these receptors. Uh, they change its shape. They twist it like a key turning in a lock. The inside of that receptor changes its shape, and now things happen. Ions flow into the cell. Enzymes are activated and products are made, et cetera. So my work uh, throughout my career has been to try to define what the receptors are, because when I started, there was a lot of skepticism such molecules even existed. Uh, so, and there was no way to study them. Uh, so the early years of my career were devoted to developing technologies that we could use uh, to study these receptors. Uh, then to purify them, isolate them, and ultimately to clone their genes and learn about their structure. And what Kobilka has done in the last five or six years is carry this to what we call atomic resolution by actually getting crystal structures so we can now see the shapes and sizes of these receptor molecules literally atom by atom. Okay, why does any of this matter in terms of clinical medicine? Well, as you heard, uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of all drugs sold by prescription in the world are molecules which target these receptors, either as stimulants, adrenaline would be an example, or as molecules which block stimulation, like beta blockers. They would be like a broken key that goes in, it can't turn, but it jams the lock. Okay. So I'll give you several examples of how the work has influenced clinical medicine and therapeutics. The technologies that we developed early on in the 70s and 80s have pretty much changed the way drugs are developed. Prior to that time, in order to screen drugs to see if they would do a certain effect, you had to set up very elaborate uh, physiological systems. For example, an isolated heart beating, or a blood vessel that's contracting, or a gland that's secreting. And now you could add the drugs and see if you'd measure something. But now with these techniques, you could look directly at the interaction with the receptor in a test tube like that. And you could screen, you know, thousands, if not millions of compounds very quickly for their ability to react with the receptor. That would be an example. In addition, in my own work, uh, we've learned over the last 10 years about a different way that the receptors can work. Now, you all know that these receptors are called G-protein coupled receptors. And why are they called G-protein coupled receptors? Because they couple to G-proteins, okay? And that was thought until recently to be the only way that these receptors can work. Well, over the last 10 years, we've discovered an alternate way, a different way that they can signal through a molecule that's called beta arrestin, okay? But it's a different molecule, which we discovered 20 years ago because it shuts off G-protein signaling. And so we discovered that this molecule by itself can also signal and do things. And then we discovered you can design drugs that are so specific that when they bind to the receptor, they can signal through this molecule or the G protein. So now, this, and, and for, depending on which receptor we're talking about, one or the other pathway may cause the effects you want, and the other pathway may cause what we call side effects. So now, whereas before you had no choice, anything you put on it would do both things, but we didn't even know this existed, now you can begin to design drugs that might do one or the other. So it, it really holds out the hope, I say the hope, of developing even more specific therapeutics than we've known before. And in fact, several compounds based on this idea are in clinical, early clinical trials. Last example has to do with Kobilka's work. Now this again, like the idea I just told you, is not demonstrated yet. But there's a whole field of endeavor called structure-based drug design, which has to do with the fact 
that if you know the atomic structure of a molecule, an enzyme or whatever, uh, then you can design drugs not by screening them or testing them, but by simply using a computer to see how well do they fit into a binding site on that molecule. So now with Kobilka's crystal structures, the hope is that it'll be possible to do this kind of design, sometimes it's called in silico design of drugs, where you can actually take what are called virtual libraries, millions of compounds. You don't actually have the molecules, you just have their structures. And now the computer for each one says how well does it fit into that structure? And when it gives you the best fits, then you synthesize that and test it. So this could be a whole new way of designing drugs for GPCRs. Again, will it be? That remains to be seen. It's, it's, a, it's a big problem, and I'm sure Nancy could speak to this uh, a lot more than I because she has actual responsibility for trying to foster physician scientists. But uh, it is sad that uh, the NIH does not attract, shall we say, the quality of individuals that it once did. There are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but I think physician scientists of the ilk of people like the three of us, uh, if not a vanishing breed, are a declining breed uh, because the demands of clinical medicine, the complexity of doing bench science, you know, th there's a whole spectrum of research. You have basic research, uh, you have clinical research, and by clinical research, I mean real clinical research, doing clinical trials, and then you have the, the middle ground of, of translational research. And when you look at things like Nobel Prizes, what you often find is that the prizes in medicine and, of course, in chemistry, but even in medicine, are often going to people who are doing very basic research because that's where, that's where the fundamental discoveries come from that alter not just a little area of medicine but a very broad area. I mean, we're talking about these GPCRs. There's no field of medicine that isn't, doesn't have receptors in it that are impacted relevant to that field. And interestingly, I, I've had fellows in my lab over the years from every division of internal medicine, uh, with the exception of infectious diseases. Uh, I don't know why that is. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I, I think that to find physicians who are willing to invest a number of years in what is already a very lengthy training program is becoming more and more difficult. MD-PhD programs are one of the last bastions of that. We have a superb program here, very competitive. Uh, but, you know, the, the model through which uh, Nancy and Ralph and I trained is very different. Now, of course, Nancy is an MD-PhD, uh, but Ralph and I were from the, uh, the, the era when, the, first of all, there weren't any MD-PhD programs. That's not what you did. You just went one way or the other. So I do think uh, for all of us in academic medicine, it's an important uh, responsibility uh, to try to foster these, these young careers. I mean, to a certain extent, I think that prizes do play a little bit of a role in that, and that they can inspire young people. Uh, so hopefully there'll be some a young individual, maybe at the Bronx High School of Science, reading this, say, oh my goodness, graduate Bronx Science, and look at that, he's a physician and he won the prize in chemistry. Uh, you know, I actually stay fairly well connected with my high school. I serve on a committee that judges a, an essay contest in the history of science every year, which is a lot of fun. Which you now are. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thunk? Uh, you yeah. The New York Post? Yes, sir. As in New York City? <laughs> wow. I used to read the New York Post when I was, yeah, when I was, I used to read the, the Times and the Post. 
just like the Yankee batting order, I could tell you exactly how the pages were laid out. But that was before uh, a lot of stuff went on. Anyway. What made your high school such a fertile breeding ground? Say that again. Well, I mean, there's a very easy answer to that. Uh, so I'll give you an example. So I think they still do this, but there was something called the New York State Region Scholarship. So that, you took a competitive exam as a senior in high school. Every senior in high school in the state of New York took it. And they gave out to the highest scores, uh, sort of general knowledge, you know, and they gave out a certain number of scholarships. And I still remember they published the names in the newspaper of the winners. There were hundreds of winners around the state. And interestingly, that's how you find, found out if you won. You opened whatever the New York Times on that day, and you looked. It was alphabetical. It took up several pages. OK. A typical high school, a good high school, might get two, four. A really smart high school might get six or eight. At the Bronx High School of Science, we'd get 800, OK, out of a class of 850. Now, in your typical high school, uh, if you uh, were one of those two or four who got the award, the scholarship, you were a big superstar. At the Bronx Science, if you were one of the 50 out of 850 who didn't get it, you were a pariah, okay? <laughs> so why did 800 out of 850 get the award? Well, guess what? We got to the Bronx High School of Science by taking a general knowledge exam and getting one of the highest scores in the city. That's how you got admitted. So it's the old business of big surprise. You put the smartest people in, and at the end, you get the smartest people out. Uh, so I don't think it had much to do with, with the high school. It's just the exam sort of pre-screened uh, for this. So it was, you can imagine what a rich and fertile uh, field they had to draw from. New York City, seething with, with all these people, these immigrant strains, et cetera. And, uh, and now you put the smartest group in there. What is interesting to me is that all previous winners from my school uh, were in physics. So I'm not sure what that's all about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess I do because I've been here for 40 years. I've been working on, uh, I've been working on my drawl. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when my, I'm not going to tell this story because it has a, a bit of an off-color thing at the end, but my kids used to practice speaking Southern when they were growing up. Uh, some of my staff is laughing because they've heard the story. I won't go into it. But, you know, one day I asked my, uh, my daughter told me she was talking, she was about six, that she was speaking Southern. I said, well, say something to me in Southern. I won't tell you what she said. Uh, it was something she heard in school. It wasn't pretty. But it really sounded very Southern. So I do like the Southern drawl. I have married a... Uh, a southern gal, Lynn, who was born and raised in Durham and whose family has been in Durham since as far back as anybody can remember. Uh, I love it down here because we have the intellectual ferment uh, around the university and with some of the cultural things which have developed uh, over the years uh, that I would have missed if it wasn't here. Uh, but I don't have to put up with the traffic uh, that you see in New York and just the fact that there are too many people living in too little space. I get to visit there. Uh, I was actually supposed to go there tomorrow, but I think there's too much going on, so I probably won't. But I, yeah, I love living here. Uh, I think it's, it's a wonderful combination of all the things that I would sort of like. And I live, you know, on a wooded lot uh, out in the woods, uh, a 10 minute ride from Duke rather than, you know, an hour's commute. I mean, it's just, there are a lot of wonderful features. Uh, one more, okay. You mean in terms of the Nobel? Yeah, so at this point, uh, all I know is uh, what I've read in previous years. So apparently they haven't given me the, the scoop on any of this stuff. Uh, but I gather that I have to be there for about a week, uh, which is going to, it's interesting. That I, was, I was telling some colleagues, I was planning to go to Australia, okay? There is a meeting in Melbourne on December 6th through 9th. Uh, it's sort of the big GPCR meeting. It's held every two years, okay.
And I've attended this many times. So this year, interestingly, they had two plenary addresses planned, one at the beginning by me to open the meeting, and one by Kobilka at the end to close it. Uh, and now neither of us are going to be able to be there uh, because we're going to have to be in Stockholm. But I guess they can put it off a couple of years. Uh, but so, yeah, there's a lot of partying that goes on there. Uh, I guess a lot of herring, uh, which doesn't help me because I'm a vegan. Uh, so I guess they'll have to find, uh, find something for me. Uh, stuff to do, you have to write an autobiography. Uh, I guess I have to put together a special lecture. Uh, there's this amazing dinner for 1,000 people where you have to make after-dinner remarks. And I'm afraid some of the onus is really going to fall on me because Brian Kobilka and I, personality-wise, could not be more different. Uh, you may have noticed I'm somewhat voluble and garrulous. Uh, Brian is painfully shy, uh, and said, the less said the better, uh, and he really doesn't like press. In fact, when it was announced that the press conference had ended at Stanford, I can't wait to watch that. Uh, I mean, I got to see this. Uh, the idea that Brian stood up there uh, and took questions from the press, I mean, I'm warning you, it's going to be very painful for him. And so I I'm really looking forward to seeing how he did. Uh, but anyway, the two of us will soldier on uh, together. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping as little as possible. Uh, I spoke to two Nobel laureates already this morning, friends who had previously won the award and called to, uh, you know, congratulate me, et cetera, and talked a little bit about them, what's it like, et cetera. And we had uh, at Duke for several years uh, a scientist named Peter Agre, uh, who won the Nobel Prize before he came here for work that he did at, uh, uh, I guess, Johns Hopkins. And then he was here for a few years and, and has moved on. And I had talked to him in the past about this. People handle this different ways. I'm prepared for the fact that the rest of this year is going to be pretty, a pretty wild ride, uh, all kinds of things going on. After that, many of them told me there's a year's worth of uh, pretty intense stuff. But I think, it, to a large part, you uh, you make these decisions for yourself. It's how, how much of the, of the hoopla uh, do you want to do? I think it's fine at the beginning. I think some people make it a career uh, and, and go around basically, uh, you know, you'll get letters from them, they have their name, and it says Nobel Laureate underneath. Well, I mean, I, I can't imagine such a thing. My stationery is not going to look any different. Uh, if people know I won the Nobel Prize, great. If they don't, I ain't going to tell them. Uh, and I really hope it changes me as little as possible. Frankly, I can't imagine it will. Uh, but I think it's a very individual thing. I, I've seen extreme examples, uh, and the people I've always admired are the ones who, a few years later, if you didn't know they won the Nobel Prize, you wouldn't know, as opposed to the ones who are quick to tell you, and every lecture they give, they have a slide about how they won the Nobel Prize. I, I know what my goal is there. Yeah. Yeah, I love my high school days. Ask me about the the Yankees lineup and see how accurate I am. Okay, thank you for that question. So, one of my very closest friends uh, in high school uh, was a, a young man named Gene Frankel. Gene was a wonderful student and one of my closest friends. Uh, Gene went on to get two doctorates, one in physics, one in history, from Princeton. Uh, and I think it was Princeton, I'm not sure, maybe one of them was from Princeton. He became a professor of the history of science. Gene died uh, at age 42 of pancreatic cancer. So a group of us who were close with him formed a committee, uh, put some money into it, and formed a, a contest at the Bronx Science, which is annual and carries a 
a scholarship now of several thousand dollars. Uh, the rules of which you have to write a five-page essay, single space maximum, uh, on some deceased figure uh, who's a great in science, somebody, some historical figure in science. We get anywhere from 20 to 40 essays a year, and we, the original group of us was six or seven. We all read all the essays, score them, and I'm amazed by the consensus. I'm frank, it's so, nothing could be more subjective, uh, but we score them, and the agreement is really pretty amazing, uh, and we give out that prize. And we've been doing this now for about, well, I, I know, it's 25 years. Uh, we've put on a couple of more recent graduates on our committee, and it is a fun thing to do. Uh, the, you find out who, whose people's heroes are. Uh, a lot of the young ladies will write about Marie Curie uh, or uh, Franklin, what was her first name? R R Rosalind Franklin, uh, who did not get the Nobel Prize. A scandal. Uh, she should have shared it with Watson and Crick uh, for the DNA structure. Uh, but what amazes me is I must have read by this time 20 or more essays about, say, Marie Curie, or certainly Rosalind Franklin. Everyone is different. The kids, each kid picks a different aspect of the life to focus on. Often it's a personal detail, uh, a tragedy that occurred in their life, uh, something about whatever. And they never get old, and it, it's a joy. I do that every spring. It doesn't take many hours of my time. Uh, and I've been getting emails, I told people, at the rate of about five per minute uh, before I came over here. And I, I've only been able to scan, but I, I've already seen in the list two emails from the six or seven people who were on that committee with me. So they must be uh, really jazzed about this. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lefkowitz. Uh, if anybody needs more information, there are student staff or here. We also have a lot of information on uh, the website, www.duke.edu, uh, and we'll also have a recording of this um, news conference available for uh, viewing shortly. So thank you for your time. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.